For more on the Idaho murders, let's bring in a law enforcement expert. We welcome in Dennis Franks, president of Investigative and Security Global Solutions, or ISGS. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. Good morning, Mitch. So let me ask you this. Uh, does the Moscow, I, Moscow, I should say, sorry, they don't pronounce it Moscow. Does the Moscow, Idaho police deserve a lot of credit here? Because a lot of people thought, ah, small town, not enough officers, not enough resources. Uh, they're going to bungle this thing. And it looks like they had it all along. I think they do. Uh, I think they did it by the book. and They do deserve a lot of credit. I think there was a, um, a joint cooperation between you know, the, the police, probably state police, and certainly the FBI had a big role in it. But they, um, I think they did a really good job here. What are your thoughts on the case that they have put together so far? I know that you haven't, uh, you know, looked at everything that the police have because none of us have, and there's a gag order right now. But, um, you know, what we see have seen in the public, does it look like a strong case to you? I, I, it is a strong case because, first of all, the DNA, um, you know, they traced it to his father, and there's the probability is that. 99.9998% of the male population is excluded from, you know, being the father. So uh, that's strong evidence. And I'm sure that once his DNA was taken after arrest, that will be um, compared and I'm sure it will be a positive result. I think that's very strong. I think that the, the cell phone activity where he's pinging on uh, cell sites, there's a very, if you read the affidavit, there's a very strong, you know, correlation between his appearance there at certain times. Um, the cell phone was turned off at a certain time period, and then it was turned back on. The, the cell phone activity also correlates with a lot of video that was taken of the white or white Elantra around the neighborhood. It was turning around, doing you know uh, circles around the, the house. It turned around a couple of times, and then it could be traced by video pretty well all the way back to, to his residence or the area of his residence, and then back again, you know, at 9 a.m., he went in the area again. So I think that, you know, the combination of all the circumstantial evidence, and it is circumstantial so far, is, is um, it's, it's accumulated. Now, it's important that, you know, anyone charged be proven beyond a reasonable doubt. And I think that's, that threshold is going to be met. We'll see what the defense is going to be, but um, I, I think it is a very strong case. Well, in court on Thursday, he waived his right to a speedy trial. Um, and now the next hearing is not set until June. So it's January now. What happens between January and June for the prosecution and for the defense as they prepare for what is a preliminary hearing, but is really far out? Yeah, six months. Um, you know, it's there's still going to be a lot of investigation. I think that the law enforcement, the police, they're still going to try to talk to as many people as they can, have any any awareness of, of Coburger, any any activities they deserve. Um, they're going to sure that um, from the searches uh, that were probably done after the arrest of the vehicle of the, his apartment, uh, they're going to look at any any kind of material that they can find there, any kind of evidence to tie him to this activity. And um, again, I think the, the witness interviews, any, any information they can get from the public is going to be important. And then there's this discovery process that the, the police, the government, the prosecutor has to turn over to the defense. Um, so there is a you know a long process here. In 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 this case, I think it benefits both the prosecution and the defense for there to be some time to assimilate everything and, and evaluate and come up with their their sides of the story. A uh, different case here, different suspect named Brian. I want to talk about Brian Walsh. We mentioned strong circumstantial evidence against Brian Koberger. I've never seen as strong circumstantial evidence as there is against Brian Walsh in the disappearance of Anna Walsh, his wife. They found blood uh, in the basement. They found a bloody hacksaw. They found a bloody knife. Uh, they say that he was lying about his whereabouts on the day that she disappeared. They say um, that uh, he Googled how to dispose of a 115-pound body, suspiciously like his wife. Uh, I am curious, though, they're still a few days in with all of this evidence made public, only charging him with misleading the investigation. So from a law enforcement standpoint, where do you benefit from holding off on charging somebody despite a lot of evidence and a lot of evidence that's actually been released to the public already? I think one, one of the reasons in that matter is because there's no body yet. Some jurisdictions require uh, that their the body be uh, found. Uh, this jurisdiction does not, to my knowledge. But yet, I think it's important that they they try to get more evidence about what happened. You know where the body may be, unfortunately. 
And, and then at that point, I think they'll feel stronger about what to charge him with, whether it's first degree murder or a lesser charge. So I, I think that's part of the calculation. Thanks for watching. Go to newsnationnow.com to find News Nation in your cable lineup. And don't forget to click the red subscribe button below to get more of News Nation's fact-based, unbiased coverage.